Welcome back to Watch It Play. My name is Rodney Smith. You guys have made it through the scenario setup. We've covered the components. Now it's time for the good stuff. We're going to get into the actual gameplay. In this video, I'm going to take you through a single turn. Now you may be thinking an entire video dedicated to just one turn. Isn't that overkill? Try to remember, this is a card game with a 25 page rule book. Each turn is seven different phases. Which is why I think some new players get a bit overwhelmed by all the rules in this game. But really through repetition, this game is not that bad. And so that's why in the first video, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to cover all the rule sets that come up in that first turn very carefully. And then in the future turns, I'm going to move much quicker. I'm still going to talk about what I'm doing, but I believe through the repetition, everything you learn in this video is going to come back and really get solidified as you see future turns take place. Now before we begin the gameplay, I'd just like to take a moment to thank Keith Collins, our executive producer for this episode and the setup episode. Thank you very much for your generous donation to this series. Now let's get started with the gameplay. Attentive viewers will notice that our layout here has changed a little bit since the scenario is set up. I've just moved all the tokens over here and I've pushed my hero cards up a little bit. I want to have space here to lay out my hand of cards that I'm going to be dealt. And actually that's really part of the scenario setup is you would deal yourself six cards. So I'm going to do that right now. There. Easy, right? So I now dealt myself my starting hand of six cards. At this point, I'm not going to explain what these six cards can do. Since we haven't played through a turn yet, their abilities wouldn't make a lot of sense. Instead, what I'm going to do is wait until I can play them during my turn. And when I bring them out, I'll explain what their card effects can do. The main thing to pay attention to at this point is that these cards are not in play. They're in my hand. If I want to bring them into play, I'm going to have to pay their cost up here in the top left hand corner. If I can do that, then they can leave my hand, come onto the playing area, and then their card abilities can take effect. On a personal level, I also like to organize my playing hand. So I'll put my attachment cards together, my ally cards together, and my event cards together. And then I'll organize them by cost. So I'm going to do that right now, and then we'll be able to begin the first phase of the first turn. As we begin the first turn, let's keep in mind the threat tracker right now is showing us that we have a threat level of 29. If this ever reaches 50, then we lose the game. So to help us be mindful of that, I'm going to put the threat level right here in the top left hand corner of the screen, like so. And now we can remove the threat tracker from the table, give ourselves a little more room. Also keep in mind the other way we can lose is if all three of our heroes are destroyed. So the first part of your turn is the resource phase. During this phase, you're going to draw one resource token for every hero you have in play. And you're going to place those tokens just below the hero's card, and this little area is going to be called their resource pool. Sometimes you might have one resource token here, sometimes you might have several, sometimes you'll have none. Also, during the resource phase, you get to draw one new card from your player deck. I've drawn the Quick Strike card. And so I'll add the new card here to my player hand. Keep in mind, as I said, this is my player hand. These cards, none of them are in play. Hopefully later in the game, I'll be able to put them in play to my advantage. Now we move on to the planning phase. This is the only phase during the game that you can bring out attachments or ally cards. So I've decided I want to bring out the Blade of Gondolin attachment and the Veteran Axe Hand ally. You'll notice the Blade of Gondolin costs one resource token, and that resource token must come from a hero's resource pool that also shares the same sphere of influence as shown on the attachment card. Now we can save ourselves a lot of time if we recognize that all of my heroes, you can just see the bottom half of them here, all come from the same sphere of influence as all of my cards in my hand. That's because I'm using a single sphere player deck. Now if you were to make your own deck and combine different heroes with different spheres of influence, then when you wanted to pay for this card, you'd have to make sure you're bringing your resource token from a resource pool of a hero that matches that same sphere of influence. So to pay for the Blade of Gondolin, I'm quite simply just going to remove one resource token. And then in order to pay for the Veteran Axe Hand, I'm going to remove these two resource tokens. Keep in mind, as long as the spheres of influence are the same, you can use multiple heroes resource pools to pay for a single card. I'm going to place the ally card here in the row with my heroes, and then the attachment card is going to have to be placed on one of my heroes. I'm going to attach it to Legolas, and I can show this by just slipping the card underneath, or you could lay it on top. Attachment cards give your heroes different benefits. We'll look at the specific benefits of this attachment card a little later in the turn. 
Now it's the quest phase. This is one of the first real opportunities we're going to get to potentially put some progress tokens on our quest deck. Remember, we're going to need to get eight progress tokens placed on this card in order to remove it and move on to the next stage of our quest. In order to do this, we have to pick certain heroes or allies to commit to the quest. To show that they've committed to the quest, you have to exhaust them. To do that, you just tip the cards on their side. Now this is really important because during your turn, your heroes and allies are going to have three primary actions. They're either going to be committing to a quest, defending from attacks, or attacking creatures themselves. And once they're exhausted, they're not able to do other actions. So if we were to commit all of our heroes and allies to the quest and exhaust all of them, there'd be no one left behind to defend against attacks from enemies or to attack those enemies back. So this is going to be one of the really key decisions early on in the game. How many heroes do you want to commit to that quest? The other important question is how many allies and heroes do we need to commit to the quest in order to accomplish our goals? In order to determine that, we're going to need to look at the cards in the staging area. Remember the staging area are the cards directly to the left of the quest deck. These are the only cards during this phase that are going to be able to prevent your progress on the quest. Let's look at those cards a little more closely. The only numbers we need to pay attention to on the cards in the staging area are their threat strength. It's the number 2 and number 1 here at the top of the card. We're going to add those together and that is the current total threat strength of the staging area. Now it gets trickier than that because once we commit heroes to the quest, we're also going to have to flip over a new encounter card, add it to the staging area and add that to the total threat strength. So we don't really know exactly how much the threat strength of this staging area is going to be until we've committed our heroes to the quest. So when we're committing heroes to a quest, we want to pay attention to their willpower strength. Because if we can commit enough heroes or allies to the quest so that our willpower strength collectively is greater than the threat strength of the staging area, then we will be able to take the difference and add that in progress tokens to our quest deck. If, however, the staging area threat strength is greater than the willpower strength of the heroes that we've committed to the quest, then our threat level is going to go up by the difference. Now the more devious amongst you may be sitting there thinking, well Rodney, I know what I'll do, I just won't commit anyone to the quest. I can't overcome the threat strength anyway, so that way I don't have to worry about the effects of failing. Wrong. Here's what happens, if you do not commit anyone to the quest, we're still going to have to flip over an encounter card as usual and add it to the staging area. Then you're going to add up the total threat strength and subtract the willpower of all your heroes currently committed to the quest. And oh that's right, you committed no heroes to the quest. So that means you have a willpower of zero. So all of that threat strength is going to be added to your threat tracker. So it's often important to commit heroes or allies to a quest even if you're not going to be able to beat the threat strength in the staging area just so that you can reduce the amount that your threat level is going to increase by. So I'm going to commit Gimli and Thalen to the quest. Their combined willpower strength is 2 plus 1 which will give us 3. So if things ended here, eh, it wouldn't be great, but it wouldn't be bad. We're applying a willpower strength of 3, and we have a threat strength in our staging area of 3. Those sort of cancel each other out, which means we don't get to put progress tokens on our quest, but we also don't have to increase our threat level. However, don't forget, we have to add the top face-down card from the encounter deck to the staging area. And now you can see we've just added two more threat strength. So now the threat strength here is 5, we only committed 3, this means our threat tracker total is going to go up by 2. And if that wasn't bad enough, look at this card that we added to the staging area. Not only did it contribute its threat strength to the total threat strength, it also has text here that says when revealed. Anytime you flip over a card and put it in play, you're going to want to check for when revealed effects. These are things that have to take effect as soon as the card is revealed. It says the first player chooses one character currently committed to a quest and deal two damage to that character. Just great. So not only did our useless dwarves not succeed in giving us any progress tokens, they're also getting injured. So the question now is which one of these heroes do we want to put two damage tokens on? 
Well, Thalen has a total of four hit points, and Gimli has a total of five hit points to work with. But there's another thing to pay attention to. Look here. We'll notice that it says Gimli gets plus one attack strength for each damage token on him. So really, in order to take advantage of his abilities, we have to beat him up a little bit. So Gimli's licking his wounds, but you know what? It's not all bad for our heroes. Thalen also has special text on his card, which we should take a closer look at. Thalen's card says, while Thalen is committed to a quest, deal one damage to each enemy as it is revealed by the encounter deck. So this means that enemy that came into the staging area will also receive one damage counter. Okay, so our dwarves weren't entirely useless. We're going to add one damage counter to the dull Galdor orcs. And now you might be thinking to yourself, we've got three cards in the staging area. And each turn we're going to be flipping over and adding a new card to the staging area. Isn't this threat strength just going to grow out of control? Well, yes, it absolutely would. Thankfully, there are ways you can remove cards from the staging area. They don't necessarily leave play, but once they leave the staging area, they no longer contribute their threat strength to the threat strength during the questing phase. We're going to look at how to do that during the travel phase, which is next. During this phase, we get one of our first real opportunities to reduce the threat strength sitting in our staging area. We do this by choosing one location in our staging area and placing it just below our quest deck. Because it has now left the staging area, it is no longer contributing its threat strength to the threat strength total when we complete our questing phase. You can only travel to one location at a time. So while this card is here, if new location cards turn up in our staging area, we will not be able to travel to them until we remove this location card from play. So how do we remove this location card from play? Well, from now on, when we collect progress tokens, instead of being able to place them on our quest deck, we are now going to have to place them on the location card. Remember, our location cards also show quest points. So once we get three progress tokens on this location card, this location will be resolved and we can remove it from play. Once it's removed from play, we will then be able to resume placing progress tokens on our quest deck. Alternatively, once you've removed a card from here, you'll be able to, during your future travel phases, bring new locations from the staging area and place them here, making them your active location. So I've decided on my travel phase, I will travel to the Old Forest Road and make that my active location. Now notice on the card in bold, there is the word response. Now response means that there's a trigger, and once that trigger happens, you have to fulfill the text. For instance, in this case it says, after you travel to Old Forest Road, the first player may choose and ready one character he controls. So by traveling to this location, we've actually earned ourselves a benefit. We're going to be able to ready one of our characters. We know what exhausting is. That means we take a card and turn it on its side like this. That means the card can no longer act during the turn. On the other hand, to ready a card means we can take it from its exhausted state and turn it upright again. This means the card will be able to act again during the turn, so I'm going to do that as I've shown here for Gimli. We're over halfway there. We're now on to the fifth phase called the encounter phase. Okay, sorry, I just want to interrupt. There's something I need to get off my chest. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm watching a really good television show and you know it's reaching that climax, things are starting to get exciting and I'm really into it, there is one thing I hate seeing come up on the screen. It is so annoying.